Hello and welcome everybody, I'm Papa Bavarian, this is number 28 of the Dev Diaries for Crusader Kings 3. Today we're going to be talking about the art focus of the game, and before we jump into this, I will tell you that I have no expertise whatsoever when it comes to art and creative processes in general, because I'm just not a very creative person. You know, uh, at some point in your life you have to accept that you have weaknesses and strengths, and that is definitely one of my weaknesses. But, I can still judge of course the art when it comes to, you know, how immersive it is, how it helps forming and shaping and supporting the game experience that you have as a player, because I am a very dedicated player of this genre, but also of games just in general and this dev diary was written by Pontus art director of Crusader Kings 3 but Pontus is currently on paternity leave first of all congratulations of course that is always a joyous occasion uh, this was then published by Joachim or Joachim that is the art lead in Crusade or for Crusader Kings 3 and there will be artists in the Paradox Plaza forum thread uh, link of course in the description if you have any questions on the art side of things definitely drop by in the in the thread and just ask some questions I think they will be there they will be receptible people you know like to talk of course about the product of their work because they have put so much time into it so I trust that there will be a lot of information additionally to this dev diary also in the thread. Now, let's jump in. What is this dev diary all about? Why is it important? Why does it matter? Art focus. Uh, first of all, this is without a doubt, without exceptions, the best dev diary so far for Crusader Kings 3, and me saying this nets all of us some sweet wallpapers uh, at the end of it. I am bribable by wallpapers, of course. Now, I don't have that influence over the de uh, developers, but if you want wallpapers, by the way, they are, of course, at the end of this thread. Now, with that being said, um, essentially, the art of Crusader Kings 3 follows the basic vision of Henrik Fahus, who is, of course, the, you know, uh, creator of the game, well, the leader, I guess, of the game. Uh, what, what is the actual term? The game director? Yeah, he's the game director for CK3, and his vision is essentially characters and storytelling as well as approachability and player freedom. So all of that is incorporated in the art focus, and they have three key pillars that make all of this possible. So let's take a look at those pillars. The role-playing experience is the first pillar, and it is essentially about everything that puts you as the player into the skin of the character character, makes it so that you feel as though you are that character in the moment. In CK2, it is something that is sometimes very hard to do because there are some burdens when it comes to role-playing, but also, your characters always look the same. And maybe more importantly, I will just uh, point this out. What do you think? How old is this guy? Look at Count Werner. He is a good guy. You know, he hangs out. He has a good time. Has a very, very good uh, hair growth right here, and he's 17 years old. Now, I'm not saying 17 years old can't have these beards, but uh, when you see a baby like Heinrich here, for example, and Heinrich is, you know, going through the world, he's a baby, he's 15, then he grows up at 16 and all of a sudden has this beard, it feels always quite a bit unimmersive. And that was a problem in CK2, because uh, subconsciously the player would go, I have now this strong beard, I'm a strong ruler and I shall rule as though I have 30 years of experience as a ruler. It's something that, personally, I noticed in the very, you know, last months even, that I always started role playing characters as though they were fully grown adults at 16, but when I was 16, I mean, my god, I felt like an adult, but it is sometimes very, very difficult to actually, you know, know what is really going on, what the circumstances of the world are. Not that, you know, if you are 16 years old, you don't have a right to uh, you know, feel like an adult. I mean, definitely feel free to do so, but I will tell you, personally, when I was back in there, I could not have go uh, been as good of a medieval ruler as I will be once I hit the 30s. Um, so this is something that definitely kind of accompanied always uh, myself and my gameplay because this in CK2 kind of makes it feel like it's not 17 but like 35. Now in CK3 of course it is seamless aging and there is much more input. So let's take a look at the screenshot for example. They have come a far far way when it comes to the character design, the way they look, the way the, the 3D models look in general etc etc and I can actually showcase this. It's something where people go oh has it improved but I can tell you it has improved. Now I want you to look at this lighting. You can see over here we have a window, that lighting, and that window is falling onto the clothing of the king, and I assume that he is a king. Now, the spouse, by the way, just looks like she's happy to be here. He doesn't, she doesn't seem like she has a special opinion about anything, but he, he looks determined. He looks like he knows what he's going to do, and he looks like he is already planning to do it. Now, this is interesting, because what we have here is a very old screenshot. This screenshot was published when the game was announced. This is Henrik Fahus' uh, alter ego. This is his in-game character. You can see the spouse is kind of really just blending into the background at this point. DDR Jake's head is just kind of floating over here and you can see the very same except a bit less detailed background right here and there is no lighting. The step alone coming to this from this is gigantic. I'm a huge fan of how the characters now actually feel as though they are in the painted world behind them. I'm a big fan of the spouse all of a sudden being in the same room. 
instead of just being phased out into nothingness. Thanos has snapped and has decided that the spouse of Lord Rivalon, up Stephen, probably not the pronunciation, has to be phased out. Now all of that is gone. It's much more nice. It's 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 very very nice. I really like the models at this point into the game development. I was skeptical when I saw them here, but with all the you know refining, with all these special touches that it got as a player, I will most certainly feel immersed. And it gets even better when it comes to the background immersion. But let's get to that when the dev diary does. What we have right here is also a character showing where he is at in life. This guy is in a very deep position. He is deeply scarred, as you can see. I assume maybe he was in a battle, for example. He also appears to be poor because he's running around just with a cap and maybe the nightgown or, you know, a peasant's gown, I suppose. I must admit that I'm not the expert on clothing in the medieval times. But he also, of course, you know, is in the same location because he probably serves at your court. And it is just so nice. Just look at this black eye right here. Just look at the scar. It looks so, so good. I would also love it if that scar, for example, like long term, were to be either, you know, not really healing, of course, but were to change its, uh, not positioning, what's the right word here, to, to change its healing progress, let's just say it like that, at some point and just become a properly fully healed scar. Maybe this is, you know, right after he got hurt, he might be severely wo wounded, it might be something like that, but I really love what they did there. It's not comparable to what we have in CK2 at all. CK2 is nice, but this is so much better. Just, it looks so nice. It really makes you feel for the character as though he just got blasted across the face, which I'm sure he did. Now, uh, beyond that, the second pillar is a medieval game, meaning that they were looking for historical accuracy in their designs wherever possible. For example, they reconstructed uh, some, you know, medieval clothing. This, for example, is the coronation tunic of Roger II of Sicily, and you can see here the concept art is beautiful. Then they have the basic art approach right there, and then the final product over there with, uh, oh, and I can't actually zoom in further here. That's okay. I can just do that right here. We have it right here. We have, I assume, Roger himself standing in a gown that really, or rather in a garment that really, really, really looks beautiful. This screams that he's rich. This screams that he is king. And this screams that this is for a special, a joyous occasion. In this case, the coronation. That is something that we also, of course, do have in CK3. I mean, in CK2, at the end of the day, you have clothing, especially, you know, before you get crowned, you don't wear a crown. After you get crowned, you do wear a crown. This guy, for example, is already crowned. I think all the rulers that are eligible start crowned in CK2. CK2 start dates, but the change between this and not this is not significant enough to actually make you as a player care about it. Now in CK2, or rather in CK3 I want to say, you will care about it because it will just be so much more magnanimous, it will be so much more beautiful. We also know there is a barber function in the game, we don't know yet again about the designer function. I would assume, until confirmed otherwise, that there is no ruler designer function in the game, but it doesn't really matter, that's just speculation. What matters here is the depiction of your character is so much more direct. You will look so much more at your character. We can see it, of course, here, you know, they are much more visible in the interface, in their clothing. It has an impact on immersion, believe you me. Now, I can't speak for the historical accuracy. Again, I can't speak for what is right or what is wrong when it comes to the actual artist design, because I'm not an artist, I'm not a medieval historian. Mad respect to all of those people. Um, but I can tell you, as a player, I look at this and I'm much more immersed than anything else. And they also, that's the third pillar, the last pillar, it, they went much harder all in on a rough world design. So essentially, you know, Crusader Kings of of course, is not a, a generic fantasy game, like for example, Elder Scrolls Oblivion, great game as well, but that was just a very generic fantasy game, pretty much. Uh, they are not going and diving into this, they want to stay to reality as soon as possible, and the palette, of course, is a bit drab, the mood is a bit drab, just in general, you know, nobody's running around with fancy, uh, various, you know, just, I don't know, purple, like, uh, what, what I mean is like pink clothing, I should, ne I should say, neon pink clothing, none of these things you will see, you will see things that are at least as close as possible to reality. Now, the next thing are characters, and you can see, for me, the real test of the characters is if they make you feel, and it is satisfying to throw especially smug-looking rivals into your dungeon, and you might feel a bit sorry for some harmless-looking characters before you plot to have someone deliver poison snakes upon them. In previous Death Diaries, we saw babies grow up, and I will tell you about those babies, my god, it did make me feel bad. When I look at a kid in CK2, I'm just like into the dungeon. Look at Heinrich, who gives a crap? Heinrich looked like a generic kid, but if I will see actual children that, you know, look like children, I will be, you know what? I can't be a cruel ruler. I don't want to be a cruel ruler, but that is something that CK3 will be doing instead of CK, you know, CK2's line where everybody looked the same as a child. I think it's very, very nice that they go really all in and essentially designing characters that show that they are living beings, or well, want to be living beings. Let, let's hope that the computer revolution is still uh, a while away. Now, the lead character artist, Niels Wadenstein, nice job, um, from what we're seeing right here, look at this, this is just, there's so much life in, the, uh, life in this single image right here, and you can see it going from the actual just basic art design of the clothing to the actual applicable one, and I think it just looks beautiful, I mean, this is just, you know, my god. 
what can I say? Again, like as an artist, or rather as a non-artist, I can't really say much about the process of this concept art and then into the 3D art, but what I can look at here will make me feel very, mu very much different if, you know, if I play, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, if I play in the steppes, if I uh, play in Central Europe, in Sicily, for example, all of those things will now have a much greater impact on how I feel about them in comparison to CK2's character portraits. Now, animation. Making the characters move was quite a challenge, since the movements need to be very discreet and not call too much attention to themselves, as that could become a distraction from the gameplay. Uh, that is something that I agree on. There is something like an uncanny valley there, for sure, that I see in plenty of games where the characters, first of all, look barely human. Uh, I think these look perfectly human. Uh, where they look barely human but then they also have just movements that look very as though they were skinwalkers like it's just not a real thing what they're doing just doesn't real uh, look realistic and we're going to take a look at this in a second so keeping the rough uh, world pillar in mind that should not be silly and slapstick while CK has some wonderful dark humor we play it straight I do think the look on a character's face when he realizes they are locked up together with a cannibal is appropriately shocked though uh interesting we don't actually see a cannibal, but that's okay now you can see these are broken but I got them saved right here let's watch the council be animated Watch this in particular here, you can see it throw up. That's just like, it's such a subtle move, but it's such a satisfying move to see. Uh, he's playing with his knife, of course, he's just standing there, ready to fight, ready to, of course, lead the armies. And doesn't it, okay, it does not loop, let me just loop it right there. And then over here, they aren't moving too much, but they are all moving, showcasing that they aren't just stale figures. Uh, this is an amazing posture, just for the record, I really love what Countess Mariana is doing here. Now, let's move on to this one. This is, without a doubt, the smuggest face, the smuggest face that I have seen in the last years, without a doubt. Look at this. Just look at this smug lady. Now, this is for the wedding celebration, and we know this went from CK2. Essentially, you can decide, hey, do you want to have a royal aid do it? Do you want to make sure that there's an extra tax, or do you just want to say, I'm rich, you don't need to pay for it, I can pay for it myself, which nets you the prestige that, of course, you know, you deserve. But look, can I zoom in here? I can. Look at this goddamn smug face. Queen Gwen uh, Gwenlian, how are you so damn smug? She must be satisfied with herself that she is marrying a king, which I can only assume is in Iberia over here. What an exciting, exciting interface. We, again, don't re uh, really get those in CK2, you know, when you get a marriage interface. Do I, can I marry someone or am I already married? I'm married. Uh, I can't request a divorce, but just look at this lady here. And she just sits there, you know, she doesn't really have an opinion on me being married to her. She just exists. She doesn't do anything to get her opinion, to gouge, to gouge how she feels about it. I have to look at these numbers now in CK2, uh, rather than CK3. I just look at this. She's smug. She's like, hell yeah, I'm a queen now. And you know what? You deserve it, Queen Gwenlian. Now, with that being said, let's move on from these two videos. And let's move to events. When an event pops up, showcase the characters involved and how they feel about the current proceedings set against the backdrop that really helps uh, sell the setting. This means if you encounter the same event in another playthrough, the visuals might be quite different due to the characters involved. You can see that right here. Uh, when we cr uh, create a new background, we also do a handcrafted lighting setup, which relights, uh, relights the portraits to fit the current scene. We already noticed this up here, just for the record I pointed out right here. This is just great, the way they did it, uh, do it here. In comparison, you know, again, remember this, it just looks so... it doesn't look alive. What they've changed here, they've changed more about the interface, but more on that in a second. What they've changed here, what they've done there is beautiful. Very, very nice. Now, what we have right here is Troubadour's dedication. Troubadour will soon be performing for the court at, Ro at Roskilde. It will be would be a simple request to have her change the performance to be a dedication to Helga, the target of my affection. This is, of course, a seduction plot. It will be a bold declaration to the lady. I prefer veiled allusions to my desire for all. I should not dabble in things like this. Look at this lady. She's just, you know, having a good time. She's living in this room and she's like, oh, there's a Troubadour. What's he gonna sing? And then you can woo her with the Troubadour. I think this is a really nice aspect, you know, to just see the character in action instead of just a static portrait. I know, again, there are a lot of people that, you know, aren't sure how they feel about the 3D portraits, but when it comes to the opportunities, I think we all have to agree that CK3 is miles ahead in comparison to CK2. And then down here we have two different pilgrimages. You can see a Catholic pilgrimage, and um, I don't know who that is. Oh, King of Denmark. And he wants to go to Jerusalem to, you know, the churches in Vatican or so in Rome, uh, Cologne or perhaps somewhere else. So maybe you can choose. Oh, actually, maybe this just indicates that there's going to be another event choice. So, you know, more options where you can go to. I don't know where this ends up, like how many choices you get, but this is pretty cool. There's a car outside, don't worry, I hope you didn't hear that. He's standing here, you know, he clearly looks Norse, he has a, a typical beard, I suppose. He looks Danish, to that degree, and that is the Catholic pilgrimage. Then down here, the Ishmaeli pilgrimage, he is a Fatimid, and I assume maybe he's even the Caliph, you can see. My god, this looks so good, the clothing is so beautiful. But he is standing in a much more Mediterranean, a much more uh, Muslim setting than, you know, of course, as a Catholic faithful right here. Uh, I assume that this is even a church. Yeah, there's, a, there's church ben uh, benches here, I'm pretty sure this is just a church, and this might be... 
Yeah, this might just be a mosque now that I look at it. And he, of course, can go to Damascus, Al Madina, to Jerusalem. And just for the record here, they do make a difference, as you can see, to the Hajj, which is something that every Muslim should do in their life if they are capable of doing it, if they have the measures, and a normal pilgrimage. This is super exciting to me, where you can go, for example, on multiple pilgrimage in, uh, pilgrimages in one life. It tells such a more, uh, such a richer story for any character. I at least think that that is what this means. But that is pretty cool. And that is, of course, an Ismaili pilgrimage, so this changes the background, the setting, the lighting, and the overall mood. And then here we have the actual Hajj, so he decided to go to Mecca. You can see his different clothing, simpler clothing that, you know, will surely keep him safe, but uh, that is also simply meant for travel. For every week that passes, my fellowship grows ever smaller. Some have gone as far as they uh, they can bef can before they need to return home overtakes them. Others have met with less fortunate ends. Most worrying is the fact that my group of personal guards is thinning out at an alarming rate. That fact alone sh uh, shows what a treacherous journey this can be. Uh, I mean, he's pretty close to it, right? In Egypt, he should be pretty close to the entire uh, Mecca holy site. Some of the locals seem like they would make fierce guards, or all I need is the protection of Allah. And you can feel he's in this field. I love it. In CK2, the events of a pilgrimage are nice, but they aren't anything to write home about. They are just another event. But this gives you the feeling that he's in that field. He's on the way to Mecca, and it's not going well. And now down here we have illustrations for the loading strings. We wanted someone who can do full Im uh, do images full of mood and storytelling in a rough painterly style. We went straight for the top and asked Craig Mullins. Fortunately, he was up for it, and it has provided some really exciting imagery. Craig Mullins, if you don't know him, has worked on so many things. Matrix Reloaded, Mass Effect 2, um... Europa and Asalus 3. That is where I recognize this style. This is a loading screen from EO3. I love these. These just, they have so much in them with so few details. It's its a really, really nice art style and I'm very, very happy to see that they got him. Uh, very nice. Uh, we saw some arts, yes, yeah, we saw some loading screens already um, in CK3. I don't have those right now, but we saw one with a birth where a child was born, the mother was lying on a bed and the father was sitting there. I think there was like an assassin in the back, something like that anyway, but it is very, very nice. I really like the style of Craig Mullins. Very, very excited to see those in the loading screens. Uh, beside the loading screens and event backgrounds, we have cool paintings for decision categories. You can see it right here, Call a Hunt. Uh, you can see a very, very artsy kind of approach there. Similar, I would argue, to the CK2 one, but this one is more detailed. I think they went more care into it, although, again, I have no idea about the actual art processes behind it, so I'm not going to say too much about it. Uh, but either way, I think this is very, very well done, very cool. And you have also, of course, you know, art for terrain types, holdings, army movements, and so on. Very, very cool. And then, of course, here we have the units, and the units differ in the different regions. So Western European, Byzantine, Middle East, and North Africa, Pagans, Indian, and Turko, Mongol. Um, I don't know, I think they could, of course, be more units, you know, more differentiation, more distinction, but I think this is a pretty extensive list as is. A, a unit has three visual tiers, becoming more armor-clad and sophisticated as it progresses. So it was important for us to make sure tier 2 Byzantine looks equally as tough as a tier 2 Turko Mongol, for example. You can see that right here, I think this is a Western style, a classic Western approach here, and this is a Muslim style. You can see this is essentially the basic unit, the mid-tier unit, the, the high-tier unit. Those will change on the map as the unit, you know, quality of an army changes. And we have the similar approach right here. This looks like an elite unit, while this certainly doesn't. It is very, very nice how much work went into those. And we have more videos here. Let's take a look at those, because those are actually the units in action. And look at that. The armies are fighting at a much more aggressive rate. Now, I don't know whether this is, uh, you know, actually how they would have fought, but I don't think that is really what this is about, because at the end of the day, it is a looping animation, of course, to just showcase what is going on on the map. You know, if uh, they actually fought, I think that would just be too long for one of these loops, for one of these simple approaches to this, but it looks much more alive than CK2 units just doing one hit animation over and over again. I'm so excited for the visuals of CK3. You can even see these tiny flags in the wind. Well, there's another combat animation right here, also set in Ireland, and there you go. This army is wrecking this army. Very exciting to see. Get destroyed, you fools. Now, you can see the blood as well, spurting all, uh, all, uh, as well. Uh, what we have here in general is just, again, an animation loop, but it's much more sophisticated, it's much more in detail than anything that we had in CK2, and honestly, in any game except Imperator. Imperator has very nice animations as well. Now, let's move on to the holdings, and that is the only part of this dev diary where I am not completely overwhelmed by how amazing it looks. Uh, the holdings essentially, you know, they of course do change based on their size, based on their tiers. We have castles and walls that have four tiers, and then temples and cities have two tiers. That makes a lot of sense. You also, of course, have different regions here, Western European, Mediterranean, India, and Middle East. And 
when you look at this, this is Western European, you can see a basic one, a, you know, extended one, an expanded one, and then the major one, the end game one, you could say. Of course, that is nice. But I will say, I was hoping for a more sprawling approach, for an approach that would make it so that, you know, as development goes up and down, you can see the countryside sprawling, you could essentially see like, you know, little houses popping up because of course the castles are important, but the castles aren't the only thing in that province. It feels slightly empty with just having one castle interface. I know why it is done, you know, for the overview, it keeps things clean, but I think I would like it. I think I would prefer it if we were to look at a situation where the castles at the end of the day were just the center of a barony instead of being the only part of anything in the barony. What, what do you think about that? That is my, you know, skeptical opinion on this. Uh, you can see this here for the, uh, I would call it just the oriental, the Muslim style essentially, and you can see this, uh, I, is this Egypt? I don't actually know. But this also, of course, you know, exceeds uh, from small to big. I really like it, and I think what I meant to say here when it comes to how holdings, how baronies are depicted, I think this is quite nice here, right? So essentially what we see is the Hagia Sophia. We see uh, a bishopric right here and right there. We see some cities over there. And then this is Constantinople, and I understand why it is the way it is, but wouldn't it be nice if Constantinople, based on how well it is doing, would be sprawling and then maybe withdrawing, and if you burn it down, there's actual flames coming out of it? Imperator does that, it looks very nice, it adds so much to the flavor of the game. And all I want to say is, I wish CK3 also did it. I like the holdings, I like the art for the holdings, but I think we could do with some sp uh, city sprawl, with some, you know, holding sprawl. I think that would be very, very nice. That would add so much. Uh, here we have Mecca itself. There you go, the Kaaba. Very, very nice. I did not know just how close to the coast the Kaaba actually was. CK2 lied to me. In CK2, it's now an inland province, but that's obviously not really true. You know, the county of uh, Mecca is very, very much close to the actual uh, coastline. Now let's move on to the map, and this is a very important point. There's a rumor going around that some of you CK2 players rarely look at the terrain map, never do it, okay. We didn't want that for CK3, so we made our map to not only be moody and pretty to look at, but also more useful, so you'd have more reasons to go there. Right, let's talk about this. I know Imperator did this as well. And I know that many people out there, for some reason, which I personally do not understand at all, for many people, they still use the political map mode in Imperator. But the thing is, the political map mode in Imperator does not actually give you more information than the terrain map mode. The terrain map mode already shows you everything. And I thought about this a lot, because I use the terrain map mode in Imperator like nothing else. It looks so gorgeous, Ex especially, I mean, with the city sprawl, of course. Uh, in CK3, I mean, we don't know the, uh, the city sprawl, but it still feels to me much more immersive when my character, you know, for example, says, I will march from over here, I assume, where are we here? Is this the Caspian Sea? Is this the Black Sea? I can't tell, but, you know, if my character decides to go from down here to up here, I can see the obstacles in his way, the way he has to cross the rivers, the way he has to go through the farm, and then go into more uncivilized territory, if you will. All of those things feel much more immersive to me, so I'm a big fan of them concentrating on the map. Do you feel convinced by this map? Um, I, I think this, for example, this is gorgeous. This is a beautiful, beautiful oasis. This is quite empty, as it should be, of course, but this is just absolutely gorgeous. I just want to reiterate, I think it would be better with City Scroll, uh, Sprawl. I don't know why I mispronounced so many things today. I think this is... Is this the Aral Sea? Are these the Urals? The Urals? I, I honestly don't know. Um, Wait a minute, what are, what are we looking at here? Are we looking at... See, I'm looking at this. Are we looking... I think we're looking actually at the Caspian Sea, right? Am I wrong here? I think it's the Caspian Sea. It might be the... It might not be the Caspian Sea, but I don't know, it doesn't really matter. This looks like wilderness. And that's a dream. That's a dream come true. I'll, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> this just looks underwhelming. I mean, it's a game from 2012, you know? I shouldn't be expecting too much. I'm just saying, the difference that we have right here, I don't want to look at this. I, first of all, don't get all the information that I need because I can't even, you know, with easy... There's no easy way of telling, like, what the actual borders are in comparison to this. But it's also just boring. Whereas when I look at this, it's not boring. I'm very, very excited by this map. Uh, again, city sprawl, though just wanted. Now, when it comes to the paper map, um, it has been well received, as they say. It has been well received by myself as well. I mean, a part of me wants the paper map on all zoom levels. I would be very excited by this. And I gotta, give me a moment here. I uh, need to get rid of this damn sound. There you go. So I'm very excited by this paper map, although I think it could also be something that I would like to see on all levels. But this is quite nice. It's a very uh, neat looking map. It's a map that looks very exciting. And by the way, when I made videos about CK3, people uh, pointed out, hey, 
why didn't you address, you know, the rip over here? Because doesn't this indicate that there will be China? And the answer is yes and. So the way I see this, I don't think this necessarily means anything. This just looks aesthetically pleasing because we don't know anything else here. It just looks like, you know, the people of Europe, and this is of course, you know, where much of this game is set in its mechanics, etc, etc. But they're like, we don't know what the hell is over there. Like, there's something there, sure, but we don't know what it doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be an expansion. And here's the thing, if it does mean that, which is fine in my eyes, it could be, it could work as long as it doesn't impact performance too much. But if there is such a thing as a, you know, upcoming East Asia expansion, it's not going to happen within the first three years. I'll be honest with you, it is not something that we should be concerned by. Anyway, let's move to the UI. Uh, we're not going to take a look at the text here at all. What I need you to see is this UI, okay, you can see the background right here, you can see this is a positive trait, this is a virtue in the faith of Amir al umar Abu Bakr ibn Umar, uh, what, what is his religion, he is Ashari, and this is uh, his, you know, dynasty, of course, he's Almoravid, but this is a virtue, for example, they changed this, you can see this was the old virtue marker, uh, something that you couldn't easily tell as a virtue, but now this one, Tells it much clearer. You can just see the green thing and you're good to go. Maybe difficult for people that uh, have a certain color blindness. I don't know. I am not color blind, so I can't really. S yeah, yeah, I don't know. Maybe there needs to be a, a more clear way for color blind people, although I don't actually know how color blindness works, I will admit. But all of this interface is not the same as the interface presented to us at first. Let's take a look at the differences. First of all, you get character lighting with the event picture in the background. You see your wife in a much more prominent way instead of just phased out. You see this guy framed. You see everybody here framed. You see additional you know, just uh, portraits right here that you could add for secondary uh, spouses. You see more color and generally see a new background image here. Let's compare this to the original design of the UI. Are you seeing this huge difference? Because I am. I'm seeing floating DDR Jake. I'm seeing phased away woman. I'm, I'm seeing no background picture here. What is that? That was a big sound, don't worry about it. I was scared by that, my god. I see all of these people not framed at all, so like it's a bit disorderly here, they're just floating heads as well, while all of this is nicely framed. You see their clothing, you see, you know, they, them grayed out, etc, etc. The revamp that they have done for this UI, even just, you know, this simple thing here that's now more prominent here, that you're over the domain limit in comparison to right there, this entire revamp is excellent. This really adds to the feeling of this UI, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, the revamp is pretty clear, I feel, the way they do it, the way they mark these in colored, uh, you know, uh, coding as well. It's, it's just way better. The original UI, I was always skeptical, I think there was good reason to be skeptical, because while I, it is clear that they want a clear UI that is easy to navigate, this one was just a bit drab. But then you look at this and you're like, my god, I can actually see where this game is going. I'm very, very excited because they have worked much more on this UI than I thought. I thought... We'd have to live with this UI for quite some time, but my god, they have uh, progressed quite significantly. Now over here we see, of course, the interface for the Minute Arms, you see the art in the background, you can see that you can raise them, you know, much like levies, of course, you have a button whether you want to reinforcement, uh, reinforce them or not, and you can see that if you build an entirely new regiment, it will take 10 months to reinforce them to full strength. This is really cool, because the way this essentially works is, if this takes 10 months and I wipe your Minute Arms, you will be essentially lame for an entire year, if you can even, inf uh, you you know, afford to reinforce your retinue at this 100% rate. So, the way I see this, um, this is an indication to me that since minute arms are so damn important in battles in CK3, if you lose them, you're gonna have a hard time winning any battles whatsoever. But the UI here in general, of course, we talked about this in the CK3 news video, the UI in general is very good about, you know, telling you what matters in combat and how much it matters, and it matters a shitload my apologies. Uh, very, very interesting. I can't wait to get my hands on this battle system because I'm very excited to actually check it out. Now, let's move on because, my god, we are 28 minutes in and we are... <laughs> we, we still got a bit to go here, I think. That's ah, not that much, actually. Oh, I'm making good time. I'm impressed by myself right now. I talk so much, you know? Either way, uh, what we see here right now is essentially a normal event picture. Let me just uh, fast forward here. Maybe I can get one as this character. If we can get one as this character, and I don't think we... I'm in observer mode, of course, but I don't think we get anything here, but when you get an event as a character, you do see the characters framed, of course, in CK2 as well, but this one is much more expressive. They will also have a mood, for example, I, Anava, gladly accept your ha hand in marriage. May Lempu bless our union, my modest husband, High Chief Tess Anava of Chuvashia. Look at that, she has agreed, she is eager, you know, to become a wife, and I think this event is a bit more colorful, a bit more, uh, you know, just atmospheric with all the paintings here in the back as well. I like where they're going with all of this, straight up. We use a lot of illustrations in our UIs to help immersion and flavor, and we have a cool system where some of the image types are context sensitive. So for instance, your Sultan will not uh, stand in front of a Western European throne if he is hanging out in the Middle East. This 
Makes perfect sense. Very cool. And if you're dealing with Catholicism and religion view, well, you see churches and similar imagery. I am very excited for this. Um, honestly, the UI, it's just, I'm very excited. It's this entire dev diary. Maybe I didn't even just say that this dev diary was the best one because he uh, bribed me with wallpapers, but maybe I just said it because it's the best one. If you don't get excited by the visuals of this, then I don't know what you could be expected. The only thing, again, for me is the map. I love terrain mode in modern games like Imperator Rome. But like, just add sprawl. I'm all for the sprawl and this will look amazing. But everything else, the UI, the characters, it is so, so good. And it goes even further because it goes to the coat of arms. We have totally overhauled the coat of arms system. We started from scratch, pouring uh, over history books and contemporary armorials to ensure every detail is authentic. We designed accurate COA for over a thousand titles and dynasties to complement a new scriptable random system that weights hundreds of unique elements based on culture, religion and everything in between. We modeled minute differences across regions, so frequencies of de uh, designs and tinctures are different in Germany, France and Spain. The amount of possible combinations? Millions. Every atom procedural. <laughs> uh, we achieved our primary goal of what is this? Get out of here! I think my, I think I'm getting mails and uh, that my that Microsoft has, has decided to not tell me about. It. God damn it! Why is it still giving me the sound though? Uh, don't worry about it. We are almost done with the dev diary. I will almost release you back into the wilderness. Uh, we achieved our primary goal of making our feudal European heraldry as accurate as possible, but we don't. It uh, didn't stop there. We wanted to go into extra depth for all regions. For example, the Eastern Hordes decorate the Great Step with their special Tamga emblems, while the Islamic world is fleshed out with immersive Sar uh, Saracenic heraldry. No more endless stars and dressions, which of course also wasn't actually historically uh, correct. The star and crescent is something that the Ottomans introduced quite late uh, as the main symbol for Islam. Emergent cadet houses uh, def differentiate their new arms by quartering and yes, England's coat of arms will change if William wins the Norman invasion. Look at this beauty. We have the original sigil, the dragon, or the wyvern, no, I think there's actually a dragon, technically speaking, uh, of England. We have the three lines of House de Normandy and then we have the combined coat of arms under Henry IV, I think, in like 1350, I want to say. Well, either way, but the way that this is dynamic is something that interests me a lot. If this is restricted to England only, or if this can actually change based on who holds it, whether you have the Kingdom, for example, of France and England in your possession, that is something that I would like to know. I would be very excited to see this not just being, for example, oh, you know, I'm a French character that holds uh, the English throne, and because of that, this is now the random Capet kind of sigil here, but instead, if you hold the crown of France and England, it becomes this. I would be so excited by that. They don't say that, so I assume it's not in, but my god, it would be so good. Now, down here, we have generated portraits, uh, or COAs, and I will say they are decentered. You can see it right here. This is not in the center. This is not in the center, but I don't think that this should be concerning because the way it essentially works is just, that's just a general UI bug right now. Um, you can tell this is just a UI bug. Every single thing is slightly off the center. Can be corrected. I'm not too worried about this, but the combinations are so much nicer. These are combinations from the steps. These are combinations in, I would guess, maybe like Brittany. It looks very Britain, right? This one as well. So like, this is just medieval Europe, essentially, uh, with this being a bit more, I would argue, maybe in Scandinavia. And then here we have uh, Indian and Muslim COAs. Very, very exciting to see this huge variety, this huge option of randomly generated coat of arms that don't look like a very strange, uh, strange little lion here, for example. I guess this isn't even like uh, randomly generated, but you know, if you if you go into this stuff here, you can cut it into pieces, but it all looks a bit weird. At the end of the day, you know, I could make the ugliest, ugliest thing ever conceived. There you go, that's my new house sigil, my god. And <laughs> either way, CK3 appears to be doing a much better job at this. And I really want to say, as a non-artist, props to what has been done here in the last five years. Such a step up in so many ways, but please do consider City Sprawl. That's really all the uh, criticism that I have to offer. This was a tremendous dev diary. So much information, so much new stuff, so much information when it comes to revamping this UI into something that isn't as bland. I really appreciate what they've done with this. Let me know what you think. Let me know whether I'm too blown away. Let me know whether you don't want City Sprawl, for example. Also, of course, a valid opinion, although, of course, wrong. Uh, for the moment, I would like to thank the members of the channel that are making videos such as this one possible, namely the Barons Aaron, Stefan, the Richest T, Snywolf, Elmer Mello, Thomas Mitchell, MFV, Florian Dahn, the Murcielago, Jacob, Rex Romanorum, Falling Phoenix, and Eterna. Then, of course, also the Count Shifty, Wombat, Kazan, and Lachlan. And last but not least, the absolutely beautiful Duke, Suspicious Duck, Nathan, Jack, Kenneth, Lexo, Goodfield, Eric, and Aiden. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel, and... Let me know in the comments what you think about this death diary. Until later, alligator.